So welcome to 2018 Sexual Harassment Awareness Training. I'm sure you had sleepless nights waiting for this moment. I'll try to make this as informative as possible, of course, and as entertaining as possible, despite the content, right? But it's important. Why is this training, do you think, in light of all that's happened, important, especially in our institution? Not all at once, please. And by the way, if you have your, thank you for reminding me, if you have your phones on, if you could put them on silent or vibrate, I'd appreciate that. And I know that as very busy directors and supervisors and managers, you want to keep up with certain things that are going on in your office and, and in the world, but if you, could keep your, if you could keep your web searches and Google stuff and fact-finding things just to see how right I am to a minimum, I'd appreciate it. Great, so I'd appreciate it so we could kind of get through it. Good? Any questions? My name, if you don't know me, is Felix Padron. I was a student here, and now I'm a supervisor in the clinic, and sometimes an adjunct faculty and master's program. Um, for those that know me, I apologize. So uh, we'll move forward. So today we're going to cover how technology works well at the university. First, um, okay. We'll get this resolved. Okay. How to set up the speaker. Okay. Click, click the... I have to use this one. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. So we're going to cover understanding what, con what actually constitutes sexual harassment. Learn the strategies to respond to that as an employee, as a supervisor and manager. Explore what employees or managers' roles are in submitting, filing, uh, receiving a complaint, and investigating a complaint. Identify the resources of support available to you here at the university. And also review the Carlos Abias University policy. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this face, but uh, I'm going to show you a really quick video of how sexual harassment can be an issue. Did the Today Show with Matt Lauer for 15 years. What is Matt's most annoying habit? Mm. He pinches me on the ass a lot. Wow! <laughs> I would have a problem with that. to see you. Morning, Matt. I've seen a lot of you lately. <laughs> Sorry uh, about that. You were. <laughs> I, I, I'd be happy to stay home, but uh, the film. <laughs> Let's just get it out of the way. You had a little more wardrobe malfunction mm. the other night. What's the lesson learned from something like that, other than that you keep smiling, which you always do? Welcome to Today on a Thursday morning. I'm Matt Lauer. And I'm Ann Curry in for, I guess, nobody this morning. <laughs> is the staircase upstairs to Matt's dressing room. Matt says around this time yesterday morning, he came down the stairs, was standing about over here, getting ready for an upcoming segment, when Willie walked in, said, hey Matt, and then Matt says he smacked him right on the tush. Do you feel victimized by this? I'm upset for a couple of reasons. One, that he denied it. I mean, why deny it? I mean, if you do it, own up to it. This man has even working hard. Uh, may have resulted in Matt dropping his guard on camera. As you can see from our new segment called Creepy Matt Lauer. Here, Michaela Scherfen won a world championship at the tender age of 17. Now she's 18. Everybody talks about how young you are, but you are no novice. You are a force. Thank you. Nice talking to you. You too. <laughs> Get it while it lasts. Do you 
were fired about 10 months after Roger Ailes was let go Correct. by the network over allegations of sexual harassment. So the network understood the subject matter. You were probably the last guy in the world that they wanted to fire because you were the guy that the ratings and the revenues were built on. You carried that network on your shoulders for a lot of years. So doesn't it seem safe to assume that the people at Fox News were given a piece of information? Okay. A lot of issues in that small clip. And we know a lot of other stories that happen in Hollywood because it's visible in politics here, um, in schools and universities other than here, in high schools. The problem is pretty uh, pervasive. And it's not just the problems that we're aware of. For example, we know that the EEOC, the United States Equal Opportunity Commission, receives about close to 13,000 cases just in 2016 which um, were filed mostly by women, about 84%, but there was a, a rising group of men filing as well, almost 17%, costing roughly about 41 million a year. <clears throat> These are the cases, who wind, cases that wind up becoming legal, not the ones that are not reported, underreported, and the ones that never make it to actual um, supervisor's ears. It is estimated, a rough estimate, that about three out of four people that are victims of sexual harassment never file a complaint, never even make, it, uh, um, make their supervisors or managers or departments as aware of it. So um, it's a big problem, and it creates a lot of residual um, negative feelings, a lot of resentment that sometimes surface in other ways that we sometimes are not clear as to why it happens, but it just kind of seems to be pervasive and progressive. The technical definition of what constitutes sexual harassment is the unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature which constitutes sexual harassment when submission to or rejection of this conduct explicitly or implicitly affects an individual's employment, unreasonably interferes with an individual's work performance, or creates an intimidating, hostile, or an offensive work environment. It's a lot of words. The most important one is unwelcomed. It has to be unwelcomed. So if you and a group of your colleagues here are discussing things which typically shouldn't be discussed, but everyone's okay with that information, it's not unwelcomed. If, however, you're discussing with your colleagues and someone else overhears and lets you know, I don't like that kind of talk, if you could please stop that, and it continues, now it's unwelcomed. So you can interact and engage with your friends if that's the way that you like to engage and discuss things and perhaps share jokes or whatever. However, if someone uh, claims that they're unwelcome, it's unwelcome, they're uncomfortable with, you have to make some sort of change and respect that person's right to work in a place that's as peaceful as possible and as encouraging as possible to, to be able to come back. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be of a verbal quality or verbal nature. It could be implicit, it could be implied, it could be a gesture. It could be leering, and we're going to get to some of these uh, behaviors. I think we follow here with, uh, yes, with a little quiz, quiz kind of stuff here. Just to kind of, it's a little boring video, but a great filler for presentations. So. Scene one. Angie wants Jack to stop flirting. Well, we started out just innocently, you know. Um. <laughs> He'd compliment me on something I had on, and uh, I'd say I liked his haircut. Just fun and friendly, and maybe a little flirty. You know, it made me feel good, and I know he liked it too. <laughs> well, it certainly made work more fun. <sighs> but then I started feeling uncomfortable, like he was taking things too seriously. And Well, we work together, so to me, dating is completely out of the question. And I said something to him. And I've made it perfectly clear to him since then that I don't want anything romantically with him. But this morning, he whispered in my ear how wonderful I smell. I just, I don't know what to do. You know, I can't work with him anymore. I'm constantly distracted, and I keep wondering what he's going to say and do next. Is this sexual harassment? 
is the behavior. You never blank where you eat because there's usually a reason for it. So you've got to be cautious in terms of um, how you interact at work. And certain things should not be kind of conducted at work. So she was okay in this video, uh, in this segment, until it was unwanted. And she made him aware of that, but he continued. And it goes on to give a couple little bit more examples. But the issue here is I know that we sometimes are very cautious, especially in this very litigious world that we live in. Because not only can a university be sued, but you can be sued civilly and personally because of whatever harassment you might conduct. So people oftentimes don't think that's an issue and you're protected by the umbrella of the institution that you work with. But not only can the institution be sued, a supervisor who may have failed to conduct the appropriate um, investigations and, and follow the appropriate procedures at the university, but also the, the perpetrator of the actual uh, harassment themselves. And we could change the word and even remove the word sexual and any form of harassment, which unfortunately sometimes happens, especially in institutions that are kind of large, right? So we have to be cautious with that. There's two types of overall definitions of what sexual harassment are, are considered. One of them is quid pro quo. Basically, doing, uh, asking for this for that, uh, something for something. So it's uh, maybe promising a promotion or a raise or, or a particular job if the person subjects themselves to a particular act, right? A particular, maybe even dating, maybe even going out just for drinks. So um, the second is a hostile work environment, which occurs when the behavior is pervasive and, it's, and it continues despite repeated uh, requests to please stop that behavior. And it becomes something quite offensive and intimidating to the person uh, who's a victim of this. And it creates an inability to work, to concentrate, to focus on what you're doing, and uh, uh, creates, again, a hostile work environment. Again, it doesn't have to be sexual in nature for it to be uh, harassment. So bullying falls into this, um, a, a couple other terms. And so we're well, going to stay on the topic of sexual harassment today. Sexual harassment can also include third parties. So we're staff, we're faculty, we're directors, we're teachers, we're professors, but there are students here. So you can be harassing to a student, sexually harassing to a student by a comment, by a gesture, by a leer, by a look, right? Um, also, if a vendor, if someone comes from Office Depot, for example, delivering paper supplies, and they say something inappropriate to you, and you make, hey, this one, that's not appropriate, and they continue, you need to report that because that's sexual harassment from an outside vendor toward you. So this applies to even guests who come here speakers who come here, presenters who come here. This is open to anyone who steps ground on the university, and that's important to know. So any third party is affected. It's not just limited to an actual advance, a physical advance or a request. It could be jokes. It could be things that perhaps you email to somebody in jest, but it's offensive. It could be particular lyrics of music that you might listen to, which is offensive. So you have to be very cautious in terms of uh, understanding it's not just what we may assume or maybe we saw in that Lauer video of certain examples and there's a lot of people I could have added videos to in terms of what is happening on Hollywood and in politics but and because of time I didn't choose to do that so and it can occur with people that are not even directly involved in the discussion so let's say that someone asks you out repeatedly and you're like you know what just just stop asking me or ha 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 or you joke and then but there's someone else offended by it or there's some sort of public display of affection here on campus and someone has said, listen, that's not appropriate for the office, can you please stop that? And it continues, that person can vicariously uh, be a, a victim of sexual harassment. If you engage in joking, like I said before, with colleagues and it's accepted, it's okay. You guys tend to do that on occasion and, and it's okay. But if someone then feels uncomfortable or a vendor is there or a student, because oftentimes we're not cautious in terms of how and when we speak. And there's people, there's bystanders walking by. 
Um, by the way, this also, affects the cl this also affects clients at the Goodman Center too. They could file complaints. And, and perhaps, and I, I hope it's not the case, an intern, a practicum student, could also be sexually harassment, uh, harassing to a client. Because even though they're not the official client, there's family members waiting in that waiting room. So we have to be very cautious in terms of how we conduct ourselves on campus and off campus. You're always on campus when you're an employee or a faculty here, even when you're not here. So you have to be very cautious in how you conduct yourself. And it's not always directed toward the opposite sex. It could be gender-based, it could be orientation-based. Be very cautious in terms of how you treat. And um, when I work with children and adolescents, I usually give them a particular uh, mechanism of which to measure their behaviors to see if it's something that's appropriate or not. And I ask them, would you do this in front of a police officer? Uh, no, probably not in front of a police officer. Then there's probably something you shouldn't be doing, right? So would you do this in front of the president? Would you do this in front of someone that you uh, respect and think would be you know, someone who could get you in trouble? Probably not, if it's a, an inappropriate behavior. So gauge, use that as a gauge to help you. Would you do it in front of an attorney of the opposing side um, in court and admit to something that you did? So use those things as a guide to help you perhaps choose how to respond. So there is a legal concept called intent where people used to say, oh, I didn't mean to be offensive. It wasn't my intent to be offensive. That's not the important factor here. It's the impact it had on the person receiving that particular uh, jeer, uh, um, leer, uh, gesture, comment. So it's the impact. And not just the impact of the potential person who received those comments or gestures, but it's the impact of those affected, the bystanders, the students in, the, in our case here. An objectively and hostile or abusive work environment is created when a reasonable person would find it hostile or abusive. Reasonable, per reasonable person is also another legal term that is used in court. When the behavior is in question, the judge, the court, assumes what would a reasonable person do or feel in this type of situation. So for example, asking someone out uh, on Fridays, hey, we're going to happy hour, want to come along? Doesn't necessarily constitute, for a reasonable person, a sexual harassing type of comment. Now. If the person says, stop asking me, I'm not going to go, I don't do that, and they continue, then it becomes a hostile, perhaps a hostile work environment situation because that unwelcomedness of the comment or the request has already been made clear. And if you're in a situation like that, and we're going to get to that in a second, document. Document. You know, when you go, and we know this unfortunately in the course of the work that we do sometimes, if a victim doesn't go to the police and file the right reports, and I'm not saying this constitutes police reports, but constitutes reporting here and letting someone know that this is going on to protect yourself. If there's no prior history, it's just as if it happened for the first time. So please give yourself and other potential victims the protection of having something documented and relayed to the appropriate uh, professionals and, and people here in, at the university. Okay. So what constitutes sexual misconduct? Of course, derogatory statements based on gender, orientation, preferences, um, what they're wearing, right? Repeated requests for dates, right? We just talked about that a little bit. And that has to be, remember, what has to be present here is an unwel uh, a comment of how unwelcome that behavior comment is. Um, sexual gender-based jokes or teasing whistles or cat calls, objectifying terms or names of people. And again, we can joke with each other if everyone's okay with it. You know, and certainly some of these things may not be appropriate, but as long as those that work together are okay with it, but if someone says it's unwelcome, you have to make the change, or you should make the change to respect that person. Turning work discussions into sexual topics or using puns. The nonverbal, of course, is the staring, the leering, looking up and down like the elevator eyes, they call that. When someone walks by or walks in, yeah, it, it's tough. It's tough, and, and sometimes it might be done in a jokey manner, and it's okay if everyone's all right with it, but sometimes it's done in a very uncomfortable manner. Another caveat that I would add here, if you're not sure how uncomfortable that is, would you feel comfortable with your daughter getting leered or stared at that way by somebody? Would you be comfortable with your spouse or partner being leered or stared at that way? your mom, your grandmother being leered at or, or, or joked about this way. Be very cautious with that. 
So um, there's also physical uh, behaviors that would constitute sexual harassment. Invading someone's personal space. And I know sometimes we may not have adequate spacing in some of the areas that we work in because it's very congested. However, be very cautious in terms of respecting someone's boundaries. Some people have a very uh, distant uh, boundary. Maybe they need three or four feet. If someone says they're uncomfortable, and, and please say that you're uncomfortable when you are, because remember, three out of four people don't report it, and then it continues, and it's pervasive and progressive, and they're doing this to other people. And some people have like zero personal space when they speak to you. It's okay to say, yeah, I, thank you, I, I need some distance, right? So just be cautious. It might be cultural. It might be something they're used to at home. Just be cautious with that. Accidentally brushing sexual parts against the other person's body, grabbing somebody, uninvited touching, neck massages. Be very cautious with these things. Visually, posters, cartoons, emails. We live in a world of a whole bunch of texts and Facebook stuff. And, and by the way, be very cautious what your Facebook content is, please, um, because that could be uh, very unwarranted and, and unwanted. So electronics stuff, we just talked about it, derogatory jokes, and we're going to get people checking in and out. So uh, just ignore those lovely sounds. So is, as an employee, as a student, as a faculty person, as a director, is your behavior sexually harassing? In order to avoid it, stay professional. Treat everyone as, if, as you would like your particular loved ones to be treated. And, and if we keep that professional stance, I think we're going to be in a much better place. It's already tense enough to work in a place that has a whole bunch of changes because of the nature of what we do here, academic changes, uh, changes of in the culture and the student body because of you know, the influx of new students and, and the graduation of those that we've worked with so hard. So um, remember to stay professional. If you are a supervisor, and, I, and I've touched on this in, when I've worked with my uh, supervisees, make sure that you let people know what's appropriate in terms of where. Because oftentimes, you know, people may come to work unbeknownst to them that they're kind of inappropriate in what they're wearing. And we do have a dress code here. And it's important to, if we expect our students to be dressing appropriately, that we dress appropriately, right, and behave appropriately. Don't make assumptions that your behavior is going to be okay because you're funny, people like you. Don't assume that. Uh, if you feel that your behavior could perhaps be bordering on harassing, ask the person if they're okay with what you're doing, if the jokes are okay. On occasion, just kind of be periodically checking and assessing for that. If you think, or if they make a comment that they're, it's unwelcome, they're not comfortable with it, please stop immediately. Don't keep encouraging. No means no in all languages. No means no. So it's not if we pursue a little bit harder, maybe they'll, you know, they're just kind of, they're a little shy. And the video that I cut short um, discusses that, where the guy was saying, well, I know she really likes me, and I really feel it. I just need to maybe push her a little bit for her to kind of feel. That's not correct. So if someone says no, you stop, period, right? If in doubt, don't say it or do it. If you're not sure, if you think it borders on something that might be offensive, don't do it. You know, there's a lot of other ways to, to maybe laugh and joke around and have a good time together that's not going to be offensive to people. I would include not talking about religion, not talking about politics, not talking about, although it's not sexually harassing in nature, if you want to keep a good flow of, of conversation and camaraderie, I would suggest not talking about those topics because there's a lot of people who feel uncomfortable with it and have to sometimes be in an environment where it's there. Um, with the Parkland shooting situation, even though it's kind of not related to this, we may not feel comfortable hearing more and more of the same, and it may be our level of tolerance and our, and our abilities to deal with these kind of horrible events comes in brief periods of time and pockets of time. So please don't slime each other with comments of what you hear on the news because it, it may not be appropriate for the person who's receiving that. But it's also, if you're that person who doesn't like to get slimed with the same material over and over again, especially something of that nature, you gotta say something. You can't then go and report something if you haven't let the person know, I'm not comfortable with that. Please don't talk about it. I don't wanna hear it because maybe they don't, and, it's and that's appropriate. All right. All right, so if you think you're being sexually harassed, say no clearly, and we've, we've said this repeatedly. Please say no. Please let the person know how uncomfortable you feel, how inappropriate you feel. You don't have to judge them or insult them. Just saying, 
I don't like that, please, please stop. Right? And make sure that you're aware of who was in the area. Make sure that you document what happened. And if it happens again, please talk to somebody. Please talk to a supervisor, uh, Carmen and HR, and let them know what's going on so that we can maybe uh, you know, put a stop to it. Okay, contact Carmen at HR for your support. Right? And we're gonna talk about the policies uh, before we finish here today. Keep records, We've, I've said this a couple of times, keep records of when it happened, who it happened with. I will always encourage you to do that. Please do that because if you need to pursue further action, and I hope it never gets to that place, you have documentation in terms of when it hap what happened, when it happened, and they're gonna need that for the EEOC. Right? The EEOC takes in a lot of r report calls, but not everything constitutes a uh, legal, legal uh, bar for them to be able to pursue and, and to move forward. Report it to somebody, whether it's Carmen or your supervisor, and be very familiar with your company policies, which we're gonna talk about in a second. I think it's about 50 pages of policy, um, but uh, actually it's only 11 pages, but it feels like it's 50 because of legal terminology. But I would really, uh, and we're gonna cover some of the more basic points toward the end, but I would encourage you to be very familiar with it because uh, that's what you're gonna be able to use to protect yourself legally. So what if it's your boss? What if it's your supervisor, your direct supervisor? What would you normally do? Because the fear is, if I say something, I could lose my job. If I say something, it could be retaliation. What would, what would you suggest to someone if it's their direct superior doing this that they could do? What's the first step? Bueller, Bueller. What's the first step in case somebody feels their boss is the one that's sexually harassing. What would be the first step? Thank you, five points for you. Tell them to stop. Tell them that you're uncomfortable. If it persists, and, re and record it by the way, if it persists, then you go to support. You go to HR for support and let them know that. That's important. I know there shouldn't be retaliation, but you're still afraid. How would you encourage someone, uh, one of your uh, supervisees you would encourage them by maybe walking them toward karma, maybe having this discussion together to, to be supported, right? To feel supported. Um, what if it won't be taken seriously? You start here, you start with a person that you feel is offending you of the unwelcome behaviors. You go with your supervisor, you go with Carmen, and there's other steps that you can take, right? So, but documentation is important to be able to take these progressive steps. How do you do with the emotional stress of an investigation? That's the hard part. Because oftentimes, the person who's being accused may be someone who might be well-liked by a couple of people. And then, now you become the bad person because you're ousting someone who is a likable person that we work with. But that behavior should never be tolerated in any place of employment. So as a manager, as a supervisor, as a department head, you have three functions. To prevent at all costs, as much as possible, to respond when the person presents to you the, the circumstances that constitute sexual harassment and to end it. This training is one of those means of doing that, education, right? Um, risk factors for harassment, right? Sometimes being in an isolated workspace, sometimes being in a place of the building where there's not a lot of traffic, and sometimes close proximity in where you work. Uh, similar or very diverse workforces, so sometimes a lot of new people coming in and out, vendors, students, there could be a propensity and a chance for this to happen. Cultures that sometimes tolerate, we don't hear, tolerate alcohol consumption, right? So sometimes like certain bars and restaurants, this happens quite a bit because there's substances also involved in the process, right? And uh, workplaces that rely solely on customer service and or satisfaction often feel compelled to, to not say and not do anything for their job security, right? Remember. Uh, the presence of a risk factor does not mean harassment is occurring in the, in the workplace. So just because these things are there, just because someone says a comment doesn't make it harassment until someone says it's unwelcome and please stop. Okay, that's important. So how do you prevent harassment, right? Fostering a culture of respect and support is very important. Encouraging immediate reporting, uh, make the policies available and you will have that available to you. And, and if 
requested. If you don't have it already, Carmen, I'm sure will uh, PDF you a version of it so you could have it available to you. And ensure an environment that's free of retaliation if someone wants to speak up. So in order, uh, in terms of fostering culture and respect, a little video here. Civility is a thing of the past, a friend of mine lamented over coffee one day. I expected her to go on and cite the current political landscape or a viral Facebook video, but instead she described her workplace. Every Friday morning, she and her coworkers file into the conference room with their heads and spirits down. They brace themselves for the storm as their boss brings the meeting to order with a bombardment of verbal rants and public humiliations. After two years of these stormy Fridays and other tirades, she's ready to see some sun. Fortunately, most leaders aren't the cause of such storms. Sometimes disrespect and incivility flourish because leaders don't make respect part of the culture. Other times it's due to inattention. Yet intuitively, most leaders understand the correlation between respect and high performance. According to the Society for Human Resource Management's annual survey, Respect for employees is the most important contributor to job satisfaction. 65% of respondents deemed it very important, but only 38% said they were very satisfied. And trust is number two. Trust between employees and senior management is gaining importance. What does all this mean? It means that leaders need to pay attention to the level of respect and trust that percolates through their organization. It's not about adding anything else to your already overflowing plate. It's not a box on a compliance training checklist or another task to add to your to-do list. Building a culture of respect and trust needs to become part of your day-to-day. -day. So what can you do? Consider these six ideas for building a culture of respect and trust. Number one, be the first in line. Like it or not, your employers are watching what you say and do. They assess whether your actions match your words. Training about unconscious bias, diversity, and inclusion, harassment, and bullying is important. But talking about these difficult topics is not enough. Your participation is critical. Number two, make respect a core value. Talk about it, offer training. Make sure your employees know you will not tolerate gossip, harassing, bullying, or any other negative or disrespectful behaviors in the workplace. Number three, make employees responsible for maintaining a respectful workplace. While it's true that you set the tone, the responsibility for a respectful work environment does not fall solely on your shoulders. Hold your employees accountable for respectful behaviors. Number four, diversity is not enough. Focus on inclusion. Listen without interruption. Encourage employees to share ideas and opinions. Let your employees know that you value the contributions. Encourage team members to collaborate and work together. Number five, show you care. Your employees are more than the role they perform in your department. They are people first and workers second. Ask about them. Spending a couple minutes connecting with your employees as people first can go a long way toward building trust. Number six, strive for fairness and transparency. Not all company decisions, goals, and strategies can be immediately shared, of course. But it's important to acknowledge things when they are happening, even if you can't go into details. Regardless of how respectful your work environment currently is, it's important to remember that building and maintaining a culture of respect and trust begins with you. It takes intention and commitment, but it's worth it. It's a win-win for the employees and the organization. just to preview that video. I hope that if nothing else besides not doing unwelcome things here, that you also hold on to that little video clip because we live in a university that's changing. It's changing. It's, it's always gonna be changing. The only constant in life is change, right? So it's important to take into account that although your needs and desires are important, so are those of the employees that we work with, our colleagues, our students, the vendors, uh, clients in the clinic. So if we could, 
incorporate some of this stuff. Instead, you know, it's easy to complain. It doesn't take much, uh, much effort to do that. And sometimes there's a lot of material available to do that with, right? So it's important, I think, to learn on how to overcome it. Because if complaining would have changed anything, we'd have uh, multiple campuses at this moment with uh, uh, students waiting in line for years to get admitted into the university. So complaints don't produce the change that we would like. It, it really falls on you. So you do the things that you think are ne necessary. But most important, I think respecting each other is, is, is very valuable. And oftentimes we don't do that. We can sometimes, I've been here long enough to see uh, the culture that we have here. A lot of great stuff, but there's room for improvement. So if I could encourage you, if nothing more, besides the unwelcome stuff don't do, please respect and, and be there for each other because we're here the, mo the bulk of our waking hours. So this is our work family, which we spend a lot more time with than our families at home, which may be okay in some situations, but, but we're here most of the time. So um, the quality of what you do and how you live here is gonna be directly based on how you respond to things and, and how you produce the reactions and the behaviors that you would like to be seen maybe uh, in, in others, okay? So, uh, your particular role as a manager is um, providing training to your supervisees, and they might be coming in the next session. They may not be here today. There's going to be new hires. So let them know what harassment is and isn't so it's clear, because a lot of times people just think because something is said, immediately it's harassment. When it isn't, it has to be, of course, unwelcomed and reported to a person. So it's kind of, there's some sort of documentation. Review with them the consequences for harassing behaviors, and those are in your policies here at the university. Clear instructions for how to file a complaint also in the policies, and we're going to cover some of those. Tailor it to your specific workplace. Um, there's different departments here, and not all is academic, but we all rely and need each other to work together to move forward. So each department is going to be different. Some departments might be a little bit less um, academic in nature, so therefore the comments, the behaviors, the gestures, the jokes might be different, and it's okay if the environment is okay with it. But if someone isn't, of course, we have to make a change. Uh, and conduct a regular check uh, just to make sure that um, you're aware of what's going on, you're aware of your team, of your department, and nothing, nothing can catch you off guard if you're kind of constantly there. Okay. So when you receive a complaint, if you're a department head supervisor or eventually will become one, hopefully, Please assure the person's confidentiality. The only people that need to be involved in this situation are the person reporting it, the person receiving the report, and eventually, if an investigation is started, the people involved in that particular complaint. Right? Um, the three fastest ways of communication, telephone, television, and tell a secret. So please be very cautious not to tell people here, oh, by the way, don't tell anybody, but I went to uh, talk to somebody about the harassment thing. Don't do that because it's going to be, before you get to your office, it's going to be past you, all the information. So if you want something to be kept private, don't tell anybody. It's as simple as that. I mean, you know, we're all, what, about 30 years old or so, roughly, work with me, right? We should know this by now, right? But yet we still engage in a culture oftentimes of doing things which are harassing in nature, not just sexual, but by comments, by gossip. Be cautious with that. I mean... We're a bit beyond that, I think, at our age, right? So please take prompt action when someone complains and someone says there's something that's happening that's, un, that's, un, that's unwelcoming to me and uncomfortable to me. Please be very prompt in responding. Keep an open mind and don't be quick to judge. Investigate. Oftentimes, when an investigation is done correctly, um, you might find that other details may have been involved. Other people may have been involved. So don't be quick to just assume, right? Keep a formal record-keeping uh, process, an informal one for you, and a formal one for the university. So for you, an informal one. Make sure that you document who came to you, wh who was involved, and then follow procedures formally. Treat the person respectfully, even if you sometimes have the inclination to assume they're a little bit dramatic in how they respond to things. They're a little bit maybe exaggerated in terms of how they respond to things. Please take them seriously because I don't want you to become one of the people they complain about because you're harassing them by not following through with things. Because you can be held civilly and personally liable, not just the institution, not, the, not just the university. And of course, follow the policies here at school. So 
Um, begin promptly when you're going to be, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, begin promptly with the process of investigation and following through to make sure and ensure that nothing becomes more pervasive um, and the hostile work environment isn't something that ensues, right? Interview the individuals and any witnesses. That's why your documentation is important. If you feel that after you've told someone that something is unwelcome, you don't like that, jot down who was next to you. They may or may not come forward. People sometimes fear retaliation, fear a whole bunch of things, but if you have those witnesses, it's important as a collaborative thing to help you on your case, right? Communicate the decision that you take individually with the people that are, you're involved with and privately. Please don't make this a department announcement. Remember, the only people that need to know are the people affected because you need to uh, safeguard everyone's confidentiality, even the person accused, which may or may not be the perpetrator. You know, maybe an email that comes that's inappropriate and you've already made that statement that's unwelcomed may not be the person who sent it. It just might be a mass email that happens to have that person's name. So just be cautious. And also enforce any disciplinary action that's available here at the school according to your policies. And if you're not sure, ask Carmen. So your role, if you're accused as a supervisor, department head, right, uh, cooperate with any investigation, please. Make sure that you document what your recollection was of that event, right? Uh, adjust your behaviors appropriately. So if someone has now made a formal complaint, and maybe you never received the unwelcomed comment, right? Justify and change your, justify, and use that to justify changing your behavior so that you don't put yourself in that circumstance again. Don't retaliate against the person who said that. And that can mean ostracizing them from meetings, from emails, from a whole bunch of stuff, which sometimes uh, very childishly, childishly can happen, uh, in, even in places this big. So just be cautious with that. Treat complaining employees respectfully. They deserve that. And maintain the confidentiality. Just the people involved should know. If it gets outside that um, circle of people that are involved, there's been a breach which should also be addressed, I think, which is important. Remember to closely follow the university's procedures during this process, which will help you. And know the university's policy. So up until this point, any questions? You guys are a very smart group. I like that. Okay. So some of your, I'm not going to go through the 11 pages here, but some of the policies which are important, I think, is to be aware that the university covers faculty, employees, students, applicants for employment. So if someone comes in for employment and they're harassed and they make comments about that, that's a viable complaint that needs to be followed up on, right? Uh, people who are here for enrollment, contractors, guests, clients in the practicum center, right? So in the, in the Goodman Center. The university also um, encourages any party who observes this to also make the report. So maybe the victim, although uncomfortable because of fear of retaliation, doesn't do anything or say anything, but if you see something, say something. We've heard that quite often, right? And oftentimes, especially with what happened recently, um, even when we do, it's a little bit slow in terms of the uptake to something for something to happen. So please be helpful to anybody who you might think is being victimized. And quite frankly, even if they're not reporting it, you're uncomfortable with it. It's unwelcomed, right? But you need to make that comment. You need to make the 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 person aware that you're, that's unwelcomed. Confidentiality, only those people that have legitimate, legitimate reasons to know should be involved. So please understand that um, sharing it with another person because it's a really hot piece of gossip is not appropriate, although sometimes institutionally common, right? Only those people that need to know need to know. Um, the following conduct will be cause for sanctions, including dismissal or termination. Needless publishing information regarding the allegations, right? So any emails, any text messages sent, um, text messages could be recovered, especially in a legal situation. So be very cautious what publications, what emails you sent. Compromising integrity of the grievance procedures, making fun of the process, minimizing the, the process itself could be grounds for termination or dismissal. Failing to, re failing to report any harassing conduct um, to the appropriate people, to the procedure that wasn't followed, or making false statements to the institution regarding something are grounds for dismissal. There's no time limitation for a sexual harassment complaint. If this was something that happened several years ago and you have appropriate documentation, that's why the documentation is important, then you could file your complaint, okay? And any form or manner of retaliation or threat of retaliation against a complainant or a witness is prohibited and is a major violation which might be 
of course, follow with sanctions and possible dismissal. So the investigative process here, any situations which constitutes sexual harassment, um, will be filed by these particular people. So if a student files a complaint, it'll go to the dean of students. Right? If an employee, faculty, applicants for employment, um, will go to Carmen and the human resource. Right? And if it's a contractor or a guest, it'll be the executive director of finance and administration who receives that complaint. Right? So these are the people who are going to be the ones receiving the complaint. 